Hello, it's Dr. Mintz. I wanted to go through a case that I encountered last night of an eight-year-old male who had been injured in a motor vehicle collision. This is the initial study which shows obviously some trauma here to the right occipital region. You see an area of hemorrhage here in the right cerebellar hemisphere. Okay, this is hemorrhage, this high attenuation area here. And here's the fourth ventricle, the pons, the temporal horn of each lateral ventricle is here. And as you go up, you can see the quadrigeminal cistern is effaced partially. Remember, usually there's a space around the two bumps of the colliculi there. So there's partial effacement of the quadrigeminal cistern. And take note of the size of the ventricles here. What you worry about when you have a hemorrhage in the cerebellum, especially, well, in any patient, but especially a young patient who has no atrophy, this uh, can cause mass effect in the posterior fossa that can compress the midbrain, especially the region of the cerebral aqueduct. And the cerebral aqueduct, you remember, communicates the cerebral spinal fluid between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. <clears throat> and that can produce obstructive hydrocephalus. So a patient also has a... Uh, calvarial fracture here. You see that little step off here. This is the internal occipital protuberance. And one of the important aspects of the location of this fracture is what vascular structure would course here transversely on each side? The transverse sinus. The transverse sinus comes over here to the sigmoid sinus. Very important anatomy. <coughs> so this fracture right here is even a little displaced in the occipital bone. And so a displaced fracture near the transverse sinus is concerned because it may cause continued bleeding from the transverse sinus. So we have this hemorrhage here and a little bit of mass effect at this point. There's actually some opacification of this right mastoid air cell. In a patient with trauma, it can be very important to look for opacification in the mastoid air cells. It doesn't typically just represent mastoid, mastoiditis, or it may, but very often it indicates that there is fracture to the skull base. And this is an eight-year-old. He certainly could have middle ear disease, but in the site of trauma and a known fracture here, you expect there could be a fracture accounting for that. And if you window it properly. Here you can see that fracture we saw, but here's another a component of that fracture coursing in the basal area of the occiput called the basi occiput, kind of radiating out from the area of the foramen magnum, off in this direction, and produces a little fracture. We don't see real well, but it's right around here that causes the opacity, the fluid in the mastoid air cell. Okay, but our bigger concern now is the hemorrhage. So this patient had a follow-up CT. Here's the follow-up CT. The first one was done last night around 10 o'clock at night and this one was done about 5 o'clock in the morning. Now you see that this area of hemorrhage in the cerebellar hemisphere has increased from about one and a half to 2.3 centimeters or so. And of course it's not surprising, but most importantly what I want you to appreciate here is look at the fourth ventricle. It's smaller. If you remember the size of the ventricle before, the fourth ventricle was a little bit bigger. Now it's smaller and you can kind of see how it's being pushed a little bit to the right. If you draw a line between this internal occipital protuberance and this attachment of the anterior falx, you can see that it's a little bit to the left. Also, if you remember the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles, they were little dots before, and now you can see them much more clearly. The third ventricle was very slit-like before, now it has this little bulbous component. The lateral ventricles were half this size. Now this is not big by most standards, but in an eight-year-old, these measure about 11 millimeters from this side to this. In the earlier study, they measured only 5 millimeters.
So this patient is developing obstructive hydrocephalus. Let's look at the quadrigeminal cistern. And indeed, you see that in the quadrigeminal cistern, this is the midbrain here, and you can barely make it out. So if you've got to get your reference, go up to this point and then just go down. And this is the this is the th midbrain. The quadrigeminal plate is here. And you really don't see any quadrigeminal cistern here. You can barely make out those little bumps. And so that is an increase in the compression of the midbrain that's causing obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct and we're creating a developing obstructive hydrocephalus. So the patient had first been called on the earlier seat, or the patient's doctor was quite concerned, as was I, uh, about the first CT and neurosurgeon was contacted and uh, didn't feel anything needed to be done at that time and then we did a follow-up and uh, saw that it was worsening and that neurosurgical intervention was definitely uh, needed at this time. This would usually call for a ventriculostomy. So rather than necessarily immediately addressing the hemorrhage itself, the most important thing to fix here is the obstructive hydrocephalus because this will cause brain herniation and serious problems like that. So they just basically drill a hole in the frontal calvarium and put a tube in that goes into the lateral ventricle and that's how they address that in the short term.